All right, good morning, church. How's everybody doing today? Everybody awake? All right, hey, if you guys would join us in uh, worship this morning, if you guys would get on your feet, we're going to sing a, an awesome, awesome song. I love this song because it talks about the love of God, right? The love of God never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. It's, it's always with us. It's something that's, that's never changing. It's always here, and I want you guys to sing it with us. So let, let's do that. Higher than the mountains that I face, stronger than the power of the grave, constant in the trial and the change, one thing remains, one thing remains. Never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love. And on and on and on and on it goes. that we can count on in life is that Jesus is always with us. I love how the Bible says that at the name of Jesus, the demons tremble. I think sometimes with us being Christians for so long, we forget what power that name holds. Sometimes we become immune to it. I remember I was going through a season in my life where it just seemed like everything was going wrong. You know, I was so overwhelmed, so discouraged. I remember not even having enough strength to even put together a, a proper prayer. I remember in that moment, all I could say was, Jesus, Jesus. 
And the great thing about that, saints, is Jesus doesn't need us to put the proper prayer together. He already knows our heart. He already knows our thoughts. He knows what we're feeling. He just wants us to come to him. I know life may seem scary right now for a lot of us, and some of us outside of the foolishness was going through other issues as it is. But let me remind you that God is still in control. God is still on his throne. God is not shaken. He is not moved. He is not nervous. He is not scared of anything that's happened in 2020. He has a plan. The Bible says he's making ways in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. That means that impossible situation you're in right now, we serve an impossible God because he makes things happen. Okay, I want us to meditate on this because I know how hard it is when things are outside of our control. We get nervous and we get scared, but I find peace in knowing that God won't always remove the storm for us, but he will walk us through it. He will give us peace in the storm, joy in the storm, love in the storm. He will never, ever leave us. It's the one thing in life that we can put, how they say, I could, you could take this to the bank. We can take this to the bank that Jesus is never leaving us. What joy is that? I know we all think about what's going on. Jesus never leaves you. He is right here in this moment with you. When you go to sleep, he's watching over you. When you wake up, he was already there. I want us to meditate on these things as we sing this next song. To remember what a privilege we have that we get to worship the risen king, that our God is alive. Think on these things as we sing this next song. Sing with us. that we get to praise you and to lift up your name, Lord. Lord, in so many other countries, what we're doing is not even allowed. Lord, they don't have the privilege to worship a risen Savior openly and freely. Lord, I pray that you be with us all, Lord. Remove any distractions or anything that's going on in our mind, Lord. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, be with Tony as he gives the message, Lord. Um, I pray that we hear the words from you, Lord. Uh, be with us all. Be with the ones that aren't here, Lord. Just bless the remainder of the service. Help us to remember, God, I can't say this enough, that we're on the winning side. Lord, you already have the victory. We have the victory. Help us to meditate on the joy and the peace that you bring, Lord, even in the midst of chaos. God, we love you. We honor you and we thank you. And we ask all these things in your name. Amen. 
Good morning, everybody. Wow, that's bad. Good morning, everybody. That's better. I, I need to know that I'm speaking to people that are awake. Uh, for everybody that is tuning in online, you guys can comment, and everybody else can actually use uh, speech or say amen or wave your hand or say whatever God leads you to say in the service today. Uh, Why we get opened, uh, starting up, uh, turning your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2, verse 18, Revelation 2, 18, and uh, keep a couple people in prayer. We have a number of people that are going through a hard time. Um, a dear lady in our church, Nora Cochran, uh, passed away this weekend. Uh, she got COVID-19, and uh, she passed away from that, and just be with the family as they go through this time of grieving, and uh, she was a sweet, sweet, dear lady, and um, service will be here Tuesday around noon. Uh, showing time will be at 11, so pray for the family. And John Atkins, that's been in our church, uh, has had cancer, and uh, he's nearing the end of his life, and they don't expect him to live through this week. Uh, just be with the family, just very, very difficult time, especially being in the hospital during this time. Not everybody's be able to be there. And uh, the closer they get, they change the rules for that and stuff. But just be with them. Just a lot of people going through a lot of stuff. Uh, I've gotten about five texts or calls this week of people that have been diagnosed with COVID-19. And I know there's a lot of tests and opinions, but these people are legitimately sick. And uh, just pray for them. A lot of people going through a lot of stuff. But um, Revelation chapter 2, talk through all these churches. I get to uh, one that uh, is really neat. It's about influence. Not a great influence. If, if any of you guys had anybody talk you into doing something that probably wasn't the best thing, raise your hand. Be honest, you're in church. There you go, there you go. I remember when I was a kid, when I say kid, uh, probably 10, 11, 12 years old, I can't remember when it was, my aunt and uncle moved to the edge of Tennessee right outside of Alabama. They bought or rented this big farmhouse it was the coolest house in the coolest area, and they had this big barn, and then they had this fence, and then they had this giant hill that went up the side uh, of uh, the, this uh, place where they had the pasture. So we were bored. We were playing, and my aunt said, I'm going to go in the town. Don't do anything stupid. I don't know why she said that, like we would ever be capable of that. So me and my uh, brother, uh, I won't mention Dave's name because I don't want to embarrass Dave with this, this thing, so I'll leave Dave completely out of this. But it was me and Dave and my cousin. And so we, we had to the, the, the edge just messing around, and we found this barrel. And I've, probably some of you guys have heard me tell this story. And they were like, you know what would be cool? If we took this barrel, we got inside of it, brought it to the top of that hill, and rolled down the side of this hill. And we're all thinking that would be super cool, you know, not, not putting physics together that, you know, somebody's going to break their neck or, you know, die from this. So we drag that barrel to the top, and we're all sitting there deciding who's going to crawl in this barrel and do this experiment of rolling down. But in our mind, it was just a matter of, you know, like rolling down the side of a hill. So Dave was standing there saying, you know what would be cool? Tony, you should do it, but before we do it, let's go to this top part, because there was a spot that went even steeper, and then start from there to get a good head start in case it doesn't roll right. So here I am crawling in a barrel, having my brother and my cousin shove me down the top of the side of this hill. And I remember it building up so, mom, so much momentum that I am just like, like in a washing machine going down this thing. I'm like, or a dryer. It's like, oh, like I'm going to die. And I remember I couldn't stop it. It seemed like it would never stop. And I remember them telling me that the barrel actually turned sideways and was going like end over end because it built up so much Speed, and you're looking at that. Why did you do that? That was stupid. I did stupid things. Actually, I probably have told so many dumb stories to you guys over the years. You're thinking, how are you alive? <laughs> My mom, when we're sitting around, will tell stories. She goes, I had no idea you did that. Probably best she didn't know half the things that we did. It would, it would have just scared her to death. But it was, it was a matter of in that moment, I allowed people to speak into my life to guide me to do something stupid. And looking back, I'm thinking if one of my older cousins or my aunt or my mom, well, they would have been there and said, no, you're not doing that. That's dumb. That's how people end up dead or crippled for the rest of their life because it's something dumb they did. I would not be where I'm at today if God would not have put the right influence. And I'm, I know that was just a kid thing. If God would not have blessed me with having good influences in my life to guide me where I'm at. 
In this message, this is talking about influence, and in my life, I remember looking back, and I, I just started reminiscing, and I started thinking, who or what was in my life to get me where I'm at? When I was in junior high age, I, I went to a small Christian school in the middle of nowhere. It was Falkville, Alabama, this little of nowhere city, and I remember going to this Christian school, and they had this teacher named Doug Canfield that was over this small Christian school. And I remember the time that he invested. The guy was a genius. He was literally the, one of the smartest guys I've ever known. Today, he, he designs and creates and does the engineering for hospital equipment. He was that smart. And I remember this guy being in my life that would speak into me. And nobody in my life had ever, or in my family, had ever gone off to college. And I remember him sitting there saying to me a number of times, Tony, you're going to be the first guy to do it. Tony, you can do it. Tony, I have confidence in you that you can do that. And I remember through the teaching and education and, and just instructions in life, he would challenge me all the time. And I distinctly remember in my mind times that this guy helped guide me to the next steps in my life. I remember being in the next Christian school that we went to. We, we, we went to the one that was closer to our house. It was Cornerstone Christian School, and I had a homeroom teacher that was one of my regular teachers, English teacher, but she was a pastor's wife. Her name was Mrs. Spears. Pastor Dave talks about her all the time. She was my homeroom teacher as well. And I remember she was more than a teacher. She was like a mom to me, like a second mom to me. And I remember there was times that I'd go into homeroom, and I'd be walking to go to class, and the bell would ring, and she'd be like, Tony. And I'd be like, yes, ma'am. And I'd walk back in, and she goes, come here for a minute. And she'd walk me over, and she did this with a lot of the students, and she'd be like, I want you to go to competition this year and do a speech. And I remember telling her, and I, this is weird for you guys now because of what I do, I remember telling her, I don't speak in front of people. I cannot do that. She said, you can do that. You're going to go to competition. I have confidence in you. I want you to do this. And of course, I ended up going to competition, and under her influence and guidance, she pushed me. I remember there were certain girls that I was interested in and in, in, in thinking about dating. I don't know how she found out about it. It's kind of scary, but she found out about it. I remember walking out of home room, and she'd be like, Tony, and I, I'd go back, and then she says, now, who are you talking to? Now, l let me tell you, and she would never dog anybody or anything like that, but she'd be like, I, I, I know God has big plans, and don't get distracted, and, and, and she guided and pushed me into college, and she played a big part in my life. Remember, from the time I was a kid till the time I was through my teen years till the time I went off to Bible college and I went through this, I had a best friend that was with me during that time. You guys have heard us talk about Bubba and Scott. That was a big part of my life. Scott and I actually uh, had a job together. We did a bunch of stuff, and I remember part of our life uh, of, was going off to college. He was there when I met Jenny. He was there when I asked Jenny out. It was there when I was eight years old. I mean, we'd been there through a lot. And I remember through my dating years of him, like different girls that I dated, she's not the one. And I remember him encouraging me. I remember when we broke up, when me and Jenny broke up. I remember how he was a Christian influence in my life during that time. I remember when I got engaged and he stood by my side when I got married. And to this day that he's a pastor and we're friends, that has been a positive, godly influence in my life from the very beginning. I want you guys to understand influences in your life will make or break you. The people that you put in your circle, the people that are in your life and you say it is no big deal. Jesus is saying in this passage right now, the influences in your life is a really, really big deal. I love truth. I love truth even when it's uncomfortable. I like somebody to talk to me even when I'm thinking, I don't like what you're saying, but I need to hear that. Jesus loves this church. Jesus is in favor of this church. These are his people, and he's speaking to them because I love you. But sometimes when you love someone and you can see that things are not right, you will tell them things that they won't want to hear. Is it okay if we talk about some things that maybe we won't want to hear today? Because God loves us so much that he's going to tell us these things through this thing. Through, through this letter of influence. Influence to allow someone or something to have an effect on your beliefs, your character, development, or behavior. Influence is allowing someone or something to have an effect on your belief, your character, your development, and your behavior. Every one of us 
as people in your life right now, we need to check ourselves. The type of influence we are and the type of influence we become. In this passage right here, they had a bad influence in their life, okay? It was, it was not a good influence. It was a very bad influence that was happening in their life, and Jesus calls it out. Read with me, verse 18, And unto the angel of the church of Thyatira, write these things, saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like unto fine brass. I know thy works charity and service and faith and patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first every city that we've talked about so far has been some form of major city this this city is uh on the outskirts it was not a port city it was not a political city it was not a money city it was kind of an insignificant city inside of it they had more blue collar people they they were not people that had money they weren't out uh building up big time reputations and financial gain or anything like that they were blue collar uh to the point where these people were uh, somewhat poor they, they were part of the guilds they, they worked with their hands to the point where even jesus when he said i am the one that has eyes like fire and feet like brass he was connecting to their culture because of them being blue collar like that we we have in history if you look back on paul one of the only times that thyatira was mentioned in scripture was the woman that was a seller of purple she she was paul reached out to this lady there was a woman named lydia seller of purple from the city of thyatira it, it was it was a outside of the city type place it would kind of be like we talked about columbus a lot of those big cities this would be more like lithopolis this would be more like canal winchester it's not as popular of a city but he says in this passage of verse 19 uh, 19 he says i know thy works actually he says that twice if you notice it he says i know thy works thy charity thy service thy faith thy patient and thy works he says it twice but then he says, in the last, it'd be more than the first. He literally says, man, I know what you've started doing. And I know the love and charity and patience and the, the godliness that you have. But he says, man, I know the last too, that it's more than the first. Literally, you guys have worked hard. You've started a lot of things. You've done a lot of things. You, you're people that were, you know, grunt workers and they built and, and iron workers. They, they, you guys know how to work. You put people with that kind of worth ethic inside a church and you're going to get the same thing. You're going to get like, man, what do you want me to do? I'm going to knock it out. What do you want me to build? I'm going to make it better. What do you want me to serve it? I'm going to do it with all my heart. That's the type of people they were. Jesus is so descriptive. He, he says in verse 20, he says, notwithstanding, he says, there's something we need to talk about. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest a woman, Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. He said, I've got to call out a bad influence that you've allowed in your life. Just walked right in. She's part of you. There's a bad influence in there. Jesus is writing from his heart to them because he cares about them. And remember, we're writing letters. Pretend like he's writing this letter to us. Dear Fellowship Baptist Church, dear church, who are you allowing to influence you? So that's the context of what he's talking about. Who are you allowing to influence you? You see, if we don't understand the big picture of why would you write a letter to begin with, if you had somebody that you knew had a bad influence in their life and you cared about them, man, and you, you didn't have phones or email or text or whatever, you would write them a letter and say, hey, man, something's, hey, can you see this? I love you, and I, I, I don't know if you see this, and we've got to understand the big picture of why Jesus is doing this, because God has so much good for us in our lives. God has a plan for us. You know, I use that personal illustration of me going through my life, of the friends that I had, and the teachers, and the ones that probably thought, I'm just doing my job, it's not a big deal, but for me, it was huge. For the fact that I'm almost 44 years old, and I look back at my teenage years, and I can remember conversations, and things that was said, and spots in my life where I had somebody push me in the right direction, encouraged me, called me out. It was a big deal. Have you ever thought sometimes when you're talking or helping people, you say, man, they didn't even listen. That wasn't a big deal. Let me tell you, it's, it's major what you do, the little things that you do in people's lives. I'm thankful for the times that they spoke into my life. He's speaking to these people because of the fact is Jeremiah 29, 11 describes God's plans for us like this. He says, I know the thoughts that I think of you. 
I think towards you, say the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. I, I, I looked up the stats on this because I know this is a true thing. And the, the Generation Z right now, which is the younger generation that's coming up, they said 9 out of 10 Generation Z today on a regular basis struggles with stress, anxiety, and depression. 9 out of 10. Makes me wonder what's reaching into their life to put on stress, anxiety, and depression. I'm not saying that to dog them at all. I'm not, I'm not trying to put them down. I'm just saying this ought to break our hearts. What are these influences? And I'll tell you, you talk about a world of influences is all around us. It's heavy in our lives right now. I wish we could see what it is. When God says in this thing, he says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, thoughts of peace. Think about those words right there when he says thoughts of peace. That's the opposite of depression, anxiety, and stress. It's the opposite. God says, I, I have good news and I have a plan for you. And he says even to the younger generation, if you guys would listen, I have plans that is not heavy, it's not hard, it's not difficult. And I'm not saying we don't have challenges. Man, we absolutely have challenges. But God says, it's not of evil. I haven't expected in, even in my life as I'm going through it. And I'm not, I don't know your life, so all I can use is my illustration is my life. But I know that God had a plan for the fact that all of those people in my life, that, 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 that Scott was there for me when I met Jenny, when I dated Jenny, when I broke up with Jenny, and when we got back together, and then when I asked her to marry me, it's where I changed my degree to youth ministries. I called to Columbus, Ohio. Led me being the lead pastor here at Fellowship Baptist Church. You said, how did that happen? Every step along the way led to that. And Satan will do anything that he can along the way to just shove you off a little bit. You say, it doesn't matter. The little decisions, like we talked about last week, every little decision will lead you off path. It, it, it's easy to think that this doesn't matter, but it has significant difference in the end. Let me ask you the hard question. What has robbed the peace of our generation? In this passage, he says you have some bad influences. Did you notice the name that when we were reading it, it mentioned the bad influence? It's, it mentions the name Jezebel. It's pretty descriptive. Have any of you in your lifetime, maybe you have, have said that I've met somebody named Jezebel? Raise your hand right now. You have, if you're watching online, put it in the comments. I want to know. You said, I've met, you guys have met somebody named, wow, okay. Not a common name, okay, for every parent here. You know, you're, 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 you're waiting for your kids to bring home that girl one day, and they're excited or whatever. You can imagine that. Your son walks to the door and says, well, who's this young lady with you? This is Jezebel. I, I don't know about you, but you're probably going to be like, okay. It's, it's like if your son or, or your, your daughter brought home a, a boyfriend. Is, what's his name? His name is Hitler. You know, he's a great guy, Mom. You would love him. He's got big plans, Mom. It's like, it, it would make you uncomfortable. I, I think it would be the same way if you brought home, a, if they, they brought home and said, his name is Judas. He's the nicest guy ever. It's like, he's really good with money. You know, it's like, I, I, I don't know. That would just make me uncomfortable. See, names mean something. This lady's name in this passage was not Jezebel. It wasn't Jezebel. He said, you have a Jezebel. It was descriptive of what's going on in there. It was for us to be able to take our minds and understand. Jezebel goes all the way to the book of Kings in the Old Testament. There was a guy named Ahab. He was the eighth king over Israel. He was supposed to be leading God's people. He was a very wicked man. Wicked heart was drawn to a wicked girl. This girl had a father and the father was a priest over idol worship. It wasn't a priest after God. It was a priest after idol worship. It was a, he was a very bad guy who married a very wicked girl. And this girl brings in all these false gods, drags them into God's people, and begins to introduce them to fornication and idolatry and wickedness and turning their eyes away from God, turning their hearts away from God. It's a bad situation. But in verse 20, he says, notwithstanding of a few things against it, because thou hast suffered this, sufferest this woman Jezebel. You've allowed her, is what that word means. You've, you brought her in. And that's why he's saying it. there's a control aspect of it. She has influence and effect, and she's brought all this negative, introduced all these things to you that should not be there in your life. 
You talk about spiritual warfare. We, we're, this, is, this is what's going on. You know, I'm going to ask you guys a weird question. Have any of you guys had a direct conversation with Satan this week? Raise your hand. You just said, man, I had a great conversation. with." I hope you don't raise your hand. If you do, you need to see Pastor Dave after service because he's, he's, he's the guy to counsel with you about that. But when you say, I don't, I don't have that happen. See, Satan doesn't come knocking on your door. Satan's not going to send you a friend request. Satan's not going to invite you over to his house. That's not, he's too good for that. The Bible talks about wolves in sheep's clothing. The Bible talks about how he's subtle. The Bible talks about how he's an angel of light. He loves to mimic what God does. He, he, he's, a, he's a fake. He's a phony. But there's a danger with that. Because this woman walks right into the middle of their life and they did not recognize her as being from the outside or as an enemy or against the things of God. It's all right because that happens. But he begins to call it out and explain the spiritual warfare that's happening. How do you test the influences that happen in your life? Now, let's just be real. I mean, like, I, I want to put this down. And like, for us as Christians, you say, how do I test these influences in my life? Okay, let, do it like this. Answer this question. Do they pull you to God or from, from God? The, the people, the things that are in your life, do they pull you to God or from God? You see in Revelation 2.20, mentions two things of the description of this woman she taught says to teach and it also says in that same thing to seduce the teaching part is the fact that she introduced information to them hey have you ever tried this hey what does is there really a god do you really have to go to church i mean is that that, that way of dating is really old-fashioned is that really wrong? It's, it was teaching. It was educating. We get that not just from bad influences. You're going to get it from the world. You're going to get it from TV. You're going to get it from social media. You're going to get that all the time to teach. But that influence didn't leave it there. It's seduce. That word seduce is the fact that they grab a hold of you to try to pull you off. It's, it's the idea of, come on, man, you can do that. What's wrong with you, chicken? Come on. I would do it. I'm doing it. Why don't you do it with us? We're all, you know, it's, you're going to be the only one not cool. You're the only one not being involved in it. And it's, it's not just the teaching or introducing something. It's the idea of pulling you into something or pulling you from. This is important for us to understand because have you ever noticed that when it comes to people getting off track or getting into sin and a lot of people's stories when they look back at their life and saying, man, how did you end up in the gutter? How did you end up with so many addictions? How, many, how did you end up with so many bad habits? And you look back on your life. I remember starting to hang out with that group. I remember when I started dating that girl. I remember when I let that dude into my life. I remember, I remember, I remember its influence. The same way that we can have stories of influence of good, we can have stories of influence of bad. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs 4.23 to guard your heart, keep your heart with all dil diligence because out of it are the issues of life. You say it doesn't matter. No, it does matter. Because when they plant that seed of what's wrong with this or you'd really like this or, you know, is there really a God or why do you, it's, it's, it's a matter of you've got to guard your heart because out of that are the issues of life. I mean, that's the good, the bad, the ugly come out of your life. Jesus exposes the agenda of Satan through this. He says in verse 24, look forward a little bit, but I say unto you and the rest of Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine and have not known the depths of Satan. I, I, I told you it's spiritual warfare, but think about how he says it, which have not known the depths of Satan. He literally, if you're putting the pieces together, her agenda of pulling them away was a lot deeper than what you could see. And a lot of times when you're saying, well, let's, we just get together and have fun, or it's just a party. Oh my goodness, it's not a big deal. You know, all these things that we say, we don't understand the depths of what's going on with that. There's a reason that God warns of guarding your heart because of the fact is that Satan has bigger plans than what you can see on the surface. Satan works for the long term. I'll show that to you as we get into this. So, dear church, who are you allowing to influence you? Now, let's break down Jezebel. Let's just break this. Jesus said, here's this illustration. Let's use it. Here it is. It matters who your friends are. It matters who your friends are. You, saw, you talk about application. 
He's talking to this church. This, it's Christians, life groups, activities, events. This person chummed up with them, walks smack in and says she calls herself a prophetess. She walked in saying, hey, I'm just like you. I'm not a bad guy. I'm not here to get you to do wrong or evil or whatever. She walked in just like the rest of them. Friendships will make or break you. It matters who your friends are. Friendships will either keep you on course or pull you far from it. The question is, and you should be asking you the question in your heart and your mind, the people that you hang out with, the people that have influence, and I'm not talking about outreach. You should have everybody in your life that you can reach out to, pray for, encourage, witness to. Yes, you should. I'm not talking about that right now. But I'm asking you this question. The friends that you have in your life, do they bring you closer to God or they bring you from God? Do they put things in your mind to make you question the things of God? Do they put things in your mind to pull you or make you doubt what is right and what is wrong? Do they? Because the Bible says in Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpens iron. So does a man sharpen. It literally means the responsibility of a friend, the responsibility, by the way, that you have is to make people better when you get in contact with them, like two knives hitting each other and coming across. You say, hey, that requires friction. Sometimes friction's okay when you love someone, when you're friends with them. Friction, coming in contact with them, it is okay because it knocks the rough edges off of them to make them sharper, make them better. Let's turn, let's turn the narrative around. What about you? Are your friends better or know God or love God more or better when they're around you? You think about it. I, I, I mentioned all these people in my life and I could have gone on with, uh, with forever. When people get around you, do they hear the praise of God? Do they hear you testifying? And I'm not literally saying that you have to like preach a message and bring them to the altar of your couch and your house and try to see them converted. I'm literally just saying in, in the very presence of that because sometimes in our life, the only thing they get is negative and they get complaining and they get, I hate this and this is stupid or whatever. And they come around you when the Bible says you should be the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth, literally meaning that you should have an effect on them. Does that make sense? You should have an effect on them. Who could stand up in their life and give the testimony of you and say, I would not be where I'm at today as a Christian if it wasn't for who that did what in their life to get them there. It matters. Not only does it matter who your friends are, it matters who you date. I said you're not going to like everything that I say, but it's truth. Jezebel is the wife of a king. And it says in 1 Kings 21, 25, if we're going to go back into the history of this, but there was none like unto Ahab. Okay, this dude was a bad dude. Which did sell himself to the work of wickedness. Literally like he sold his soul to the devil. In the sight of the Lord, now listen, whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. She, she was, first of all, Ahab should have been the godly king that they were supposed to be over a godly nation. His heart was wicked. And I'm not throwing this all on Jezebel by any means, but I'll put this, man or women, whoever you are, it matters who you date. She pulled him from God towards sin. Here's the challenge from the word of God. You need to date someone that's going to make you better for Jesus Christ. Do we have any Christians in here, any at all? Am I, like, is there any believers in here, moms and dads, that would be like, let me say something. You should date someone that makes you better for God. You should. You should date someone that pulls you towards God in everything that you do. Date someone that is going to lead you closer to God, man or woman. I'm going to say this, and I said this in the other service too, but this is so important that we understand. We have a lot of ministries and a lot of ways that we do outreach in our lives. Dating someone is not an outreach. It's not a ministry. I'll give you a thousand illustrations of a ministry. Who you date is not a ministry. You say, I'm just dating them, and I know he's lost, and I know he doesn't do the right things, and I know he has no love for God, but I'm trying to reach him. Reach him as a friend, not as a boyfriend. It's not how it works. 
Guard your heart. Do you know what you do when you're dating somebody? You open up your heart wide. You're inviting them in. You say, why are you being so hard on this? You don't date them to convert them. You don't date them as a project. You don't date them to try to change them. That's not at all. The Bible actually says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? The reason why I'm saying this is we can use the illustration of Jezebel and how she led them away, but I'll tell you, in our life, in our society to now, with people having the mindset, it doesn't matter who I date, and they're lost, and that doesn't matter. It's how a lot of people get into deep, deep issues down the road where they have divided homes and trials and tribulations where they don't agree, they don't have the same morals, they don't have the same perspective, they don't raise their kids the same way because they didn't start the right way. If they are not marriage material, they are not dating material. They're not. Girls, you need a, you need a leader, not a project. I hate to say it, but in our culture today, it seems like there's a lot more projects out there than there are choices. Maybe the guys need to listen to here. If they're looking for a spiritual man, you better understand that you can't be a lazy bum with no desire for God and no desire to be in your Bible and think that they're going to be attracted to you as, as a leader. And they come back with the idea, well, they go to church. There's a lot of people that go to church. I'm not looking for someone that goes to church. I'm looking for someone. No, I'm not going to looking for anybody. I'm talking out here. Yeah. <laughs> you should be looking for someone that lives it. Lives it. You know, if girls come up and says, I say, is he a Christian? You know, well, what do you mean? It's like, she goes, well, he goes to church. I don't care what building he shows up in. That, that's how a lot of girls get at those like, what are you, a Christian? Oh, I go to church. They'll say whatever they want. You're cute. You're pretty. I'm going to say whatever you need to hear. I'm not being mean. I'm telling you from the word of God about the influence that will change your life. Guys, I don't care how cute or pretty she is. Find a girl that loves Jesus. That loves Jesus. And I promise you will change your life. You think, man, you just old-fashioned, trying to, no, I'm telling you, these are truths for the word of God. And the Bible talking about you're going to have friends, and you can reach out to them, you can love, and you can influence them, and invite them to church, try to change their life. But when it comes to your heart and your future, don't be unequally yoked. Marriage is way different than any other kind of relationship where you lock yourself till death do us part with someone that does not care about the things of God is not right with God. Here's the third thing. It matters what you listen to. We're talking about influence. We're talking about Jezebel here. I said, man, he's all over the place. No, this is straight out of the word of God. This is straight from Jesus' illustration. As he writes to them. And here's, here's what's going on in this passage. He's talking about Jezebel. He's referencing the Old Testament. Ahab was a wicked king. Ahab had opposition. His name was Elijah. Elijah was a man of God. Elijah was a great man of God. Elijah approaches him with all boldness and says to Ahab, he says, gather all your false prophets together. God's going to do something. They gather them together. There was a drought. They build up an altar. They dance on top of the altar. They scream. They cut themselves. Nothing happens. They're trying to pray down fire from heaven to see who's the true real God. Nothing happens. Elijah stands up. And not only builds the altar, but they douse it full of water, which was a big deal because they were in a drought. And they built a little a channel around it and filled it full of water. Elijah just steps back, kneels down, lifts his eyes up and says, Lord, I pray that you will do what you've called me to do so they will know that there is a God in Israel. Whew, fire comes down from heaven, consumes the whole thing. There's nothing left. It even licks up the dust in the water. Ahab comes home, you know, like the wimp he was, and cries to his wife because he was a, a, a loser. And he walks to the door, and his wife says, what's wrong with you? Oh, Elijah showed up, and he, and he proved me to be wrong, and all my prophets are gone, and things like that. So uh, it, Jezebel sends out a message. Here's what Jezebel sent that out. Then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah that wasn't her himself. This is what she told or sent out in a message form saying, so let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. She literally 
gave him a death threat. And he sat there and said, but he was a man of God. He was, he was serving God. He was at all this. Let me tell you, it's amazing how much you can love God and have the wrong influences speak to your brain and to your heart and pull you away in a way that you never thought would happen. He just experienced God bringing fire down from heaven. The, 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 the enemy rises up and says, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, revival breaking out. But we are human. Don't ever put yourself on some sort of super high spiritual level thinking you're above anything that can bring you down. But himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat on a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die. Do you know what this is? This is stress, anxiety, and depression. Do you get that? God, I'm not even like my father's. I'm not good enough. I'm a failure. I, I'm a loser. I'm not good enough. It's better that I just die. Take away my life. How did that happen? He received a message and Satan was behind to get into his mind. I talk about guarding your heart. Guys, it is important for Christians to guard your mind and your heart when you turn on the TV to the news channel. You talk about bringing you down. You talk about feeling like, well, may as well not even live tomorrow because everything's going to fall apart. The economy's going to fail. The you know, politics and everything would just get so angry. And Satan would use, you just flip the channel, you'll get it down to their perspective anyways. They'll just change the numbers and change the view. I mean, that Satan will do anything to get to your heart and mind. Same thing with people that sit around listening to the talk radio all day. By the time you're done, you're just like, there's no point of life. You're just nagging. That's why it's important that you fill your mind full of things that are holy and right and true and set your affection on things above. Heard that message from Pastor Chris a couple of weeks ago. Sin comes in different forms. We talk about anxiety and those, the pressures and the fornication and everything. It also comes in worry. It comes in fear. It comes in stress. It comes in bitterness. You can be angry. All these other things that Satan also wants to put in your mind because of what you listen to. Dear church, let me ask you, who or what have you allowed in your life to influence you? And the people, the things that you've allowed in your life, are they pulling you closer to God or fun? Because the thing is, even with the teens here, you say you go to camp and, man, I want to serve God, and all of a sudden you start going with those friends that are pulling you away, and you're saying, man, I shouldn't be doing this. Why am I this? You need to change your friendships if they're pulling you away from God. Here's the second thing. Are you willing, dear church, are you willing to accept the consequences? Are you willing to accept the content? He, he made it very simple in this letter. He gave, he gave the warning of the influences, and then he just talks about the consequences, and he closes with this. Like I said, I love the truth, and you need to understand this principle that I'm about to give you, that Jesus is about to give you, because it's heavy. It's deep. The Bible says about every man is tempted when he is drawn away. That is the word seduced right there. When a man is drawn away his own lusts, when you're sitting there going through life, and you have friendships in your life, and say, well, maybe, maybe I don't need that or maybe that is not true or maybe that is not right and it pulls you away whether you're a man with addictions problems whatever it is be careful of what pulls you away because it says this of his own life and enticed because it doesn't stay there it never stays there then when lusts have conceived now there's verbiage that's going on in this that is related to uh, revelation 2 when, when it says when it's finished it bringeth forth death when it's conceived when it gets into your heart and mind there's nothing wrong with dating a lost person. There's nothing wrong with skipping church. There's nothing wrong with living immoral. There's nothing wrong with premarital sex. When it gets in your mind and all of a sudden you're thinking differently, that sin will destroy you. The Bible gives this principle, and it's, it's mentioned in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, about sowing and reaping. In front of my house right now, when I'm leaving on to Bryce Road over there by my house, there's a giant cornfield, and we watched it. They plowed it. They, they planted the seed. Nothing happened. It was a huge failure. Day two, nothing happened. Just scream out the window, failures! Where's your corn? Day five, day six, day seven, day eight. And then all of a sudden, little things started peeking out. It takes time. See, the Bible says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. 
God says something and say, well, it, that doesn't matter. God's not, God, you, God says it, it, it's going to happen. For whatsoever man soweth, planting the seed, that corn will also come back in a few months, weeks. For he that soweth in his flesh and of his flesh will reach corruption. Guess what comes? Corruption. But he that soweth of the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. There, there's a principle in your life. Teenager kid, from the beginning of your life, the things that you sow, the decisions that you make, the things that you participate in, the things that you have in your mind, the things that you watch, the things that you participate when you're dating. You say, this doesn't matter, and I'm going to do this, and I, I can, you're, you're sowing seeds. Do you know how I can know this, and anybody that's ever counseled and things with this, this is a hard thing when they're living it up, and just, I just want to have fun, and she's cute, and this is it, and they don't go to church, and it's not a big deal. Then my office, 12 years later, Pastor, I don't know how to break this news to them, that I love them, and we want to get married, but they don't know about my disease. They don't know about my past. They don't know about a child that I have. They don't know, they don't know, they don't know. Because sin doesn't just go away. It might be under the ground. It might not be able to be seen. But when you're sowing unrighteousness, it comes out. You say, what does that have to do with this? He says to this in Revelation, he says, and I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Let me tell you two choices that you have when it comes to this. You have the choice to make things right. Do you notice the, the wording of that? He says, and I gave her space. Literally, I gave her opportunity. I, I, I presented. I, I, God said, I gave her a time. I gave her an opportunity. I gave her a place or a location. I gave her space to repent. This is Jezebel. I, I mean, the spirit of Jezebel. You think about what God is saying with this. There's nobody. I don't care how far you've gone. I don't care how deep you are. I don't care how big your list is of your bad or your past. doesn't matter. God still gives you opportunity to repent. Serve a great God full of grace and mercy. And he says, I gave her space to repent. And I don't, I don't know what that was, conviction. And maybe it's teens going to camp. Maybe it's sitting in a service. Maybe it's listening to the radio as you go down there. He says, man, I spoke into your heart and said, that ain't right. That ain't right. That ain't right. But she chose not to repent. To change. Again, God is using a metaphor, an illustration, that you adulterers and adulteresses in James 4. Now listen to this, same thing. Behold, verse 22, Behold, I will cast her in bed, into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. We have a phrase that is being said in this. You make your bed, you're going to sleep in it. If you want that, you've got to understand, you're saying, I'm choosing that. God says, just crawl in bed with Jezebel. Crawl in bed and have your affair with sin. Engage in it. Because it's your choice. You have the choice to repent. God said that in that verse. But here's the second thing that he says. You have the choice to live with the consequences as well. Because you are choosing the consequences. Now don't judge this verse without understanding the context of it. Verse 23. Jesus says, and I will kill her children with death. And I was like, whoa, what? Uh, that's... Context, context, context. You crawl in bed with sin. You, ingra you, you, you engage in that. And sin, when it has conceived, bringeth forth death. You cannot engage in that kind of lifestyle. You cannot engage with sin. You cannot engage in so that kind of thing and have joy come out of your marriage, joy come out of your life. You cannot live it up in sin as a single or date wrong or have that immorality or be a husband that's unfaithful with your eyes or your heart. You cannot be that person that brings junk into your life and think it's okay. It doesn't work out. And what comes as a result is a marriage, a relationship that you sit there and say, it's dead. There's nothing there. It's so awful. He said, I'll throw you into a bed of tribulation. That is the opposite of good. That is the opposite of joy. That is the opposite of blessing. Remember God said, I know the plans that I have for you, plans of peace and not of evil. It's not of God. People say, well, I grew up in church. Well, whoop-de-doo. Where in the world did God ever say showing up to this building is going to make you turn out right? 
That is a false misconception for any parent too that says, well, they were raised in the youth group. Yay, they went to teen activities and ate lots of pizza. Does it make you morally right? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. It matters what you have in your heart. It matters the influences in your life. It matters what you do. It matters. It matters. And he says, I'll tell you what, if you're going to live this lifestyle, and God says, I'll tell you what, I'm giving you the choice to repent, and you're choosing not to. And now in your life, and the choices that you have, you've crawled in bed with her, you've had a baby with her, but let me tell you, that baby that's going to come out of your life, it's going to be sin, and it brings forth death. I'm not going to leave it there, because God doesn't leave it there. There's two parts of sowing and reaping that we need to understand in the Bible. Here's the part of sin but it's also the part of righteousness and he says in verse 23 and I'll just say that he says I am he that searcheth the reins of the heart and I will give unto every man according to your works you will get what you sow into life but verse 24 but I say unto the rest of Thyatira uh, I'm, I'm, not everybody's doing this not everybody's followed and allowed that Jezebel to influence them as many have not this doctrine, have not listened to this in their minds, and have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. Now, you might not understand that now, but let me tell you, Jesus said very clearly, come unto me, and he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That God comes alongside of you in the matter that God doesn't put on bondage that you have regrets of STD and regrets of decisions that you made and records and all this. And I'm not saying that to make anybody feel bad. Oh, that is me and I've done all that. Then at any point in your life, you have the opportunity to get things right with God. But I'm telling anybody at the beginning of their life, check your influences and get ready to reap the benefits or the sin of whatever you're sowing right now. But he says this two different ways. He said, I give you a life that is not heavy. I didn't give you a burden. I think only some of the parents in here would fully understand or some of the older people in here would look back and say, I'll tell you what, I've carried a lot of junk through my life as a result of dumb decisions that I made. A lot of bad decisions that I made that just made life heavy. I'm trying to do everything else and I've got this backpack of, uh, of just sin, trials, things that came into my life. But I love this. Verse 25 those that hold fast till I come and overcometh, keepeth the words unto the end. To him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule over them with a rod of iron and vessels of a potter. Shall they be broken into shivers, and shall receive of my father, and I will give him the morning star. Now, first of all, he starts saying the blessing of what is to come, because we're in Revelation, we're so looking forward to when we're ruling reign with Jesus Christ. But he says unto them something really cool. He says, I'm going to give you the morning star. I've talked different things before and says Jesus gives you peace because he is priest. Jesus gives you satisfaction and Jesus gives you joy. He doesn't say that here. In Revelation chapter 22, he references the morning star being Jesus Christ. Do you know who I have in my life as I have the plans that he has for me, not of, not, not of evil but of peace as God has for the influences that I'm to guard my heart as I go through life? You know what God said that is with me that he'll give me? Jesus. You say, well, yeah, I mean, obviously, you understand that with Jesus, I have all the joy and the blessings and the power and the strength and the confidence. Everything that God is, he gives to me. I have the blessings of Jesus Christ, and I'm not here to brag. Actually, I am here to brag. I'm here to brag. God has been really good to me as a Christian. I didn't get married with regrets. I wasn't worried about skeletons in my closet. I wasn't worried about disease. And I'm not saying that to make anybody feel bad. But along the way, because of the influences that I listened to and the things that God put in my life, and I'm not rubbing this in anybody's face, but all I can say is, man, God has been really, really good to me. And I want to say to anybody that's here that's struggling on the fence with this, that God has really, really good things for you too. Not of the burden and not of the regret and not of all those things, but truth and goodness. But it matters with who you allow in your life because they're either going to pull you towards God or they're going to pull you away from God. But it is a choice. So I ask you this question right now. 
Who is influencing your life? And are they pulling you closer to God or from God? Who are you influencing in your life? Are you pulling them closer to God or from God? And what are the consequences that are going to come from that? And are you willing to pay for it? Because God said, I will throw you into bed and you will reap what you sow. Let's pray. God, as we close out this time, I just pray, Lord, for those that are in this very moment, Lord, that you've called to their mind, you've called to their heart things that are not right, influences that are not right, things that we have allowed, just like this church did, to walk right inside of our lives, and we know it's a constant battle that they pull us away. Lord, help us to understand the severity of this. Help us to understand, Lord, that this matters to you because you have good for us. Help us, Lord, to allow it to shape our future because we listen to you for the steps that we're taking right now. I pray, Lord, for those that don't know you, that they'll reach out and know you as a personal Savior that wants to rescue them and change them. And there's no sin, there's no past, there's no problem that's too great for you. Help them to understand that you are a God that died on the cross to set us free and that there is hope and joy in you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Tony, for that great message. I know I needed to hear it. I do want to remind you about uh, some of the different ways that we have that you can give. If you've been giving online, you can continue to do that. Uh, go to our website, fbc.family forward slash give, or if you just go to the website, it'll be easy to find all on there. You can also give through the Church Center app. Uh, that's the app that our church uses, and it's very, very easy to give uh, with the app. If you've been mailing in check or cash, you can continue doing that, and if you've been bringing it with you, we have a giving box in the back lobby and then on the back wall here in the auditorium as well, and that's an easy way to give um, if you did bring your giving with you. Uh, if you're new with us today, we're glad you're here and we'd love to get to know you a little better. Please come and talk to one of us, but also fill out a digital prayer and connect card. So if you don't have that Church Center app, you can get the app by texting the word APP, A-P-P, to 614-385-1888. And then within that, uh, you'll see a prayer and connect card that you can click, fill it out, let us know any prayer requests that you may have, and uh, it gives us a way to better know you and learn, learn more about you. Uh, if you don't want to do that through the app, you can also call the church office and give us that information so that we can uh, be in touch. Next Sunday, we'll be doing pretty much the same thing as we did this Sunday. So a 930 service for those that are 55 and older or at risk. And then at 11 a.m., we'll be online and in person for everybody else. And we love for you all to be here again. Uh, and then also at 11 o'clock is FBC Kids Worship. Uh, they're, they're over there meeting right now, and they'll be doing that again next week. And then Wednesdays at 7 p.m., we have our in-person Bible study right here in the auditorium. That's also live streamed. Uh, and then real life students, we meet. And then uh, FBC Cadets for Christ, they meet over in Big City in Kidstown, and they meet and have uh, their kids' classes and everything going on on Wednesday nights as well. Uh, we will be starting up nursery here soon. So in the month of August, we're going to start up nursery. So August 2nd, which is the first Sunday in August, we're going to be opening up Toddler 1 and Toddler 2. So that is for those that are 15 months to 3 years old. Toddler 1 and Toddler 2 will be open starting in August. That is only during the 11 o'clock service. Only during the 11 o'clock service. And then on Wednesday night, so starting August 5th, only toddler two will be open. So those that are ages two and three years old uh, will have nursery open for those ages. If you have any questions about that or uh, anything that you need, you can talk to my wife, Lydia. She's the nursery director. Uh, she'll be back at the table uh, here in the, in the back lobby. So if you have any questions or if you want to volunteer, please go talk to her. Uh, she'd love to answer any questions that you may have and talk to you about it. Uh, if you brought with you, which I hope you did, if you grabbed a baby bottle for the baby bottle fundraiser for the Women's Clinic of Columbus, those are due today. So if you, if you have them with you, that's awesome. You can turn them in either at this table or at um, the, one of the, any of the information desks. You can turn them in there, and this will be a great help to the Women's Clinic. I know that they will really enjoy uh, getting these funds, and it will really help them uh, continue doing the work that they're doing, uh, which is very, very needed. We'll go ahead and pray, and you will be dismissed.
Dear Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for all that you do for us. I pray that you'd give us a good rest of the evening. I pray that you'd keep everybody safe in their travels. I pray that uh, you'd help us to enjoy our lunch, whatever it may be, and that we would do all that we do to your honor and your glory. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You're dismissed.